Hey, this is Warren Bird, Research Director at Leadership Network. I got the privilege of talking with two experts on the important topic of church boards. A lot in the news today. Do you, do you have an external board? What are the pros and cons? Do you pay board members uh, for churches? Uh, lots of stuff we're going to dig into quickly. I've got uh, Dave Travis, CEO of Leadership Network, and David Middlebrook, an attorney in Dallas and founder of churchlawgroup.com. Dave Middlebrook, let's go to you first with a, a high-level question. Do churches need a, governing, a governance board? And if so, what must the governance board do? Sure. Thanks for having me, Warren. Um, you know, churches, most churches are incorporated. There was a time that, that churches didn't avail themselves of corporate status. But a church being incorporated, it's a legal fiction. It's a person under the law. And the board of directors serves as the ultimate legal authority for that board. And so, uh, although they're not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a church, they're, they're charged with directing the church in terms of what the big picture activities are the church are, and also to answer for the church in terms of a, a lawsuit or any other legal uh, proceedings, whether it's acquiring property or whatever. So they are the legal um, uh, representative of the entity. Dave Travis, any comment? Yeah, I think the other thing that, David has alluded to here is that uh, churches are actually uh, controlled. There's a state issue here and a bi-state issue. Um, some states have slightly different uh, incorporation uh, procedures, documents, what you have to name, etc. So there are a couple of state things occasionally that you have to keep in mind. Um, I think the other thing I, I do want to say is that a lot of times what's happening is that people confuse, I believe, uh, a couple different terms that we use in the church. I think what we're talking about today here is governing board, uh, and there's a certain board that you may need for that. For others, you may have an elder board or a deacon board or some other name, and those don't necessarily have to be the same things. Yeah, and some churches just collapse that into one group uh, versus other churches that can have multiple groups that uh, help give oversight to the direction of the ministry. So Dave Travis, keep talking, but tell us about ideal group size, and then Dave Middlebrook, if you'll do likewise, especially if there's a legal uh, requirement. Um, ideal group size, I am not, uh, as you know, Warren, I'm not a proponent of what, there's one ideal. I think different churches need different sizes for different tasks. Uh, part of that's based on their history, their tradition, um, what they're intending to do. I think that uh, group size functions three, seven, 12, you know, there's some magic numbers depending on what you're trying to do. So I've seen very effective church boards of 25 and 50 even. I've seen very effective boards that were as small as three uh, or seven. Uh, I think a, a smaller size is preferable for many churches as far as governance. I think when it comes to eldership, shepherding people and looking after people, bigger sizes could be possible. So I don't center on one number as an ideal size. You know, one of the things, and I, I would echo uh, some of the things that Dave Travis said earlier, number one, a lot of people do get confused about whether or not nonprofit status, which is a state law issue, state law governs nonprofit status, as opposed to tax exempt status, which is a federal issue. So anyone listening needs to first be familiar with what is the state law as it relates to being a nonprofit in your state. Uh, and so when we talk about board size, every state uh, has some minimum requirement. Many states it's three, uh, some states it's two, and there's a few states that you can have as, as few as one to set up a nonprofit. But that's a state law issue. And so in terms of what's the ideal size, it's kind of the Goldilocks rule. It's, you know, it, it depends on your organization. When it, it can't be too small and it can't be too large. It's got to be just right. And so what just right is for you depends upon your organization. And I also agree that there are some magic numbers. Uh, part of it has to do with deadlocks. Uh, you don't want to have uh, a situation where there's an even number on both sides of a position and you can't resolve a deadlock. So odd numbers are good. Three, five, seven, 10, 12. And at some point, I think there's just a practical aspect in terms of how effective can the board be when you need to convene a board member, a board meeting, uh, to get everybody in the same place so that they can at least address the issues that need to be addressed. And that's something that everyone has to answer for themselves. 
Um, it, I've noticed that it, when you do have the larger boards, many times the boards will then elect a, an executive committee, for example. If you have a board that's, you know, north of 21 or whatever, and there's a lot of people involved, they'll turn around and then elect an executive board that functions as a smaller board to take care of many things. And then the big board only meets, for example, at the annual general meeting of the board, and the executive board meets more regularly. So you just see all types of uh, uh, organizations and what works for them. And that, that's what we always tell folks is that the great thing about living in our country is you get to do it the way that you feel like God called you to do it. Now, the other thing I would pick up on that Dave said earlier is that you have to be careful and cautious that when you do have these overlapping boards for example you have elders and deacons and trustees you really want to be clear about what the demarcation is between uh, the, the duties of those folks um, I I always tell people when they get their bylaws out and bylaws are the laws by which an organization <laughs> must live uh, they should open it up and read it and as they're reading it it should reflect who they are uh, not who somebody else is or who someone up, upstream says they should be, but really, how do you operate? And one of the questions they would be answering is, how big a board do you need to have? How, how many people do you want involved uh, in, in, in setting the direction and being a director of a board? Very helpful. Uh, David Middlebrook, continue on, but let's talk about the topic of external boards. We're At Leadership Network, we're seeing a lot more of that. That's making the news a lot more, where people outside the church are being brought on to the senior board. Why is that happening? Well, I, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> assume to know why everybody's doing what they're doing. I think there's there's a, a sense that, you know, we've seen a migration and these things seem to kind of go in cycles, for example. Um, historically, there were members and members in the nonprofit setting of an organization serve as the equivalent of almost a shareholder inside of a church. And then we saw uh, there was a move away from membership and congregants only and there being a board. And oftentimes the, the board was then made up of congregants within the or the congregation of the church and then you start seeing people say no we really want to bring in expertise and people that have experience and maybe they they're doing a bigger ministry and they want to bring in that that uh, uh, influence into the organization to help them grow uh, so there'd be a host of reasons why people might do it it's it's uh, again it kind of goes back to the Goldilocks rule you know what's right for you what's right for your organization and and, and what helps you to be successful Dave Travis, pros and cons of having an external board? Well, first, let's say that, uh, and you've heard me give this speech before, Warren, most nonprofits across the United States almost all have external boards. Uh, it's really, churches have been somewhat unique uh, in having uh, so many internal boards or kind of people who are participants. Um, and so if you look at most nonprofits across the country, the people who are on those boards aren't necessarily the recipients of that ministry, uh, but they're engaged in such a way that they're invested in the success of that ministry. The second thing I would say, one reason why we're seeing more of this, is as we've had a lot of new churches planted in the last 20 years, where either the denomination or the church planting agency uh, has... Uh, been invested in that and has wanted to have a supervisory role in the direction of that new church start uh, for a fairly long season until it is kind of independent of itself. The third thing I would say on that is there are many polity issues at play here and uh, in some of the more mainline and connective polities there may be a local board but the ultimate authority on the control of the lead pastor really is in the denominational hierarchy. And a lot of folks don't realize that. They would think they have a local board, but they can't hire or fire really their pastor um, without the permission or the direction of um, somebody on up the chain, I guess you'd say. David. David Middlebrook, uh, what about the ethics and legalities of having an outside board member, especially someone who's paid or maybe not paid to do the board, but they, they come and speak because they're familiar with your church and they get paid big numbers. So it's kind of going back and forth that uh, I pay you, you pay me. 
Uh, are there any uh, clear lines that churches should keep in mind? Well, uh, first of all, um, independence is a big issue when you're serving on a board. Every, every member of a board, uh, and maybe we can circle back and talk about this later, the d distinction between officers and directors, that seems to be an area that people get very confused about. But, but um, in, in terms of your independence, uh, you can serve on a board and not necessarily be independent, but if you are not independent, then it's going to limit uh, what actions you can take on behalf of the organization, what you can vote on, for example, compensation for, for executives within the organization, because the rules, and this would be federal, not state, uh, the, the federal rules as it relates to setting compensation uh, in a nonprofit setting, uh, it has to be reasonable compensation and it has to be approved by folks that are independent. Uh, so then you have to start looking at, well, what is the nature of transactions uh, between the organization and its directors? It could be honorariums. It could be all just a myriad of things. We couldn't begin to list how they, they uh, would be disqualified uh, for voting on compensation, for example. So you have to look at those issues to determine whether or not that board member uh, can act in all capacities. And, and, you know, we always tell folks fiduciary is not just a made up word. Uh, when you serve on a board, you are a fiduciary. And many people that gets bantered around, they have no idea what that means. But it's just very simple that you have, you have legal duties, a duty of care, a duty of obedience, a duty of loyalty. Okay, you have to do you have to be reasonable, you have to take care of the organization, you have to obey the law. And so independence would be one of those laws that you're obligated to fulfill if you're going to vote on someone's compensation. And in turn, the organization has an obligation to make sure that anyone voting on someone's compensation is in fact independent and qualified to vote. So those situations that are reported in the media uh, raise all of those kind of questions and they have to be vetted very carefully uh, so that the organization can fulfill its duties and that the individual directors uh, can fulfill their fiduciary duties. Dave Travis, who typically sets executive compensation? Is it uh, always the board? Uh, and, and how does that play into this discussion? Uh, if it's a nonprofit, the board has to set the top executive's uh, compensation in most cases. Uh, now, in most of the cases that I know where there is an outside board, even an inside board, I, I have many churches that we work with that uh, would gain uh, either through a study or an opinion or other um, input data from other similar organizations by which they can use to set that compensation. But uh, in, in for uh, not-for-profits, and I'm not an attorney, I'll yield to David on this, that uh, especially for the executive level, the board does have to approve that uh, compensation. David Middlebrook, any legal no-nos or any comments on what Dave Travis has said? Well, no, no he's spot on. And, um, you know, there's something called the safe harbor rule uh, under the IRS regulations as it relates to executive compensation in the nonprofit setting. And to take advantage of the safe harbor, I like to say, say sailing into the safe harbor, which is somewhere everybody wants to be. Uh, I envision hearing Jimmy Buffett songs if you, if you get into the safe harbor. But you do that by having an independent board, uh, uh, having independent directors uh, vote on the compensation for the executives, and then relying upon qualified comparability data so that they can ensure that the executive level compensation is reasonable. And if they do that, then they get the benefit of the safe harbor rule and uh, to do all of that, it's predicated on the fact that the people that are voting are, in fact, independent, meaning they're not directly or indirectly being swayed by any um, remuneration, remuneration they're receiving from the organization. And that's whether they are an external board or an internal board. Doesn't matter. Just Doesn't matter. If you're a director, just by virtue of you being a director, to be qualified as an independent director and to serve, for example, on an independent compensation committee, by its very definition, independence means that you don't have uh, any monetary incentive to approve a compensation package for uh, an executive in a nonprofit, uh, and you can do so completely untethered from any other considerations other than doing what's the best thing for the organization. And David Middlebrook, when it comes to pastoral succession, 
uh, do those same principles and laws apply uh, if the bylaws are not otherwise specific? Well, again, every director has a duty of care, a duty of loyalty, and a duty of obedience. That's the definition of what a fiduciary duty is. Unfortunately, and we can go back not too distant future, great organizations that have built, been built over time, and they didn't address the succession issue appropriately. And as a result, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking, frankly, to see um, how those churches have been lost or the, the, the assets that have been donated over time have been lost because they didn't address that issue. Now, is that necessarily a legal issue? No, but it certainly strikes right at the very heart of what the point of being a director is. You're, you're charged with the care of the organization, not just today, but uh, looking forward to the future. And, and not addressing succession issues, I think, is um, very problematic for organizations, particularly when you have to remember that you're, you're really given this... Uh, this, this obligation to make sure that, that, that the mission is carried out over time and it's not necessarily only about an individual or an individual family, but it's about the, the, the greater mission and the greater good. Dave Travis, let me give you opportunity if you want to respond to that. And then let me also ask you, how do you advise pastors who are writing books or are doing other things and then using the platform of their church to promote their, if you will, side business or side ministry? How do, how do you advise them about the appropriateness of, of entanglement and overlap? Uh, well, let me say, let me go back to the succession piece for just a second, because this is a piece where I do a lot of consulting, as you know, Warren, and it's amazing how many leaders have not looked at their own bylaws that may they have even helped write about when it comes to the succession issue. And as a, you know, you talk to those leaders and they're talking about succession and you look at the bylaws and it does address succession, which all, sh all of these should. Uh, and then they say, well, we're going to change this before we start this process. Well, I think that's fine to do, but you better get that ready before you start the process that you envision. Um, and so, uh, so the, anyway, I'll just say that your bylaws should cover what happens in succession. Um, and if they don't conform to what you think you're going to do, you might as well set those straight now and go ahead and work on that process uh, to have that in place. Because what you don't want is a successor being called or being placed and then there to be disagreement or about the process of succession just because you didn't do it the way you say you were going to do it in your bylaws. Um, so I will say that. As when it comes to now to your second part, which is about other ministries um, that the pastor may have um, that involve their preaching and their sermons and those kind of things. I'm not the expert legally there. That issue was of keen interest 20 years ago and is still of keen interest. Uh, I think there does need to be clear understanding uh, with the church's governance board about those things. After that, I, I'm not an expert in those matters, Warren. I know there's been some recent articles in various publications about that that attempt to address that, and there's still debate going on you know, between folks about those issues. And some of those articles have been written by David Middlebrook at churchlawgroup.com. So, David, let me have you weigh in on uh, how to sort that out. And let me make it more complicated. Uh, suppose that uh, people who have given money for the church building and all, suddenly we find the building title in the pastor's name. Uh, is that appropriate? Um, no, that's like a, 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 an opportunity to go to prison. <laughs> the, let, let's back up and talk about books for a moment. Uh, the issue that, that's getting batted around right now is, is uh, intellectual property. Does the pastor own his sermons? Uh, can the pastor then take the sermons or some of the material from sermons and make them into derivative works, books, curriculum, Bible studies, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer to that, the answer to that question is absolutely but understand that the default rule is, uh, without getting into a debate spiritually about it, the default rule is under the copyright law that uh, when you're an employee of an organization uh, that, that absent a written agreement to the contrary, that it's a work made for hire. Okay, now we can have debates about that philosophically, but just start with that black letter rule. So what does that say? 
Well, I think it argues in favor of having an agreement. And if you have an agreement, in part, it should address the issue of intellectual property, but it should address a whole lot more than that. And most pastors don't understand that the First Amendment and the, the um, uh, exemption for religious discrimination that's found in Title VII for religious employers, that cuts both ways. It cuts in your hiring decisions. It also cuts in, in the termination decision, meaning that if you're a, a minister of the gospel and you're performing sacerdotal functions, and you get terminated, you literally don't have any employment rights. Okay, so you can't complain about anything uh, because of that same right to discriminate on the hiring. You have the right to discriminate in termination as well. So by having, for example, the senior pastor or senior executive level folks that are primarily charged with creating intellectual property, sermons and, 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 and other types of materials, get it straight. I mean, who owns it? And so the, the question that, that, that that's fascinating to me when it's debated in the media is, you know, should a pastor have a book and does that help the church? And if he's promoting it from the pulpit, I would say, well, of course it does. I mean, if the, if the senior pastor of your church has a, a nationally uh, recognized book and is, is getting a lot of media attention, how does that hurt the church? It only helps the church by raising its profile, raising its recognition in the community and making people more interested in coming to church, which is the whole point of the thing. In addition, you're reading material that hopefully has an impact on your spiritual life. So, I mean, it's a win, win, win. Where the problems come is when people don't understand the law, they don't get the issues clear, and they don't put it in writing so that, that, that everybody is treated fairly, okay? And that the, the, the pastor's hard work outside of maybe at night he's writing a book or whatever, as long as he has the rights to that underlining material, and then he has a right to earn um, uh, royalties on the sale of that book. What we encourage churches and pastors to do is say, you know, carve out, uh, no royalties are paid, for example, from the church on sales of your book, and let the church buy back at a preferential buyback rate from the publisher so that when they sell the book, they're going to make more profit than, than uh, the, the average bookstore would on selling it. So there's, there's win-wins that can be built into all of that. It's not necessarily wrong. The problem is it's like so many things when you don't deal with the details and address those details ahead of time that you can really find yourself in a bad position. Now, back to your question about the pastor ends up owning the church, um, you would have to give me a whole lot of uh, underlying facts that I could ever imagine that that scenario would be appropriate. Maybe we could come up with something that I would say, well, I guess under that circumstance it makes sense. But generally, they can't own the church. Nobody owns the church. It's a public charity. Uh, I, I own the church. You own the church. By virtue of them being a nonprofit, they're a public charity. The property itself is pledged to charitable purposes for nonprofit purposes, so no individual can own it. Uh, and it goes back to your very question, what's the purpose of having a board? Well, there are the legal representatives charged with the duties, the fiduciary duties of overseeing this public charity, this nonprofit religious organization. So um, it, the, those are problems that, that folks get into because they don't understand. Uh, and, you know, the misunderstanding is, 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 is at such a fundamental level when people talk about nonprofits it surprises me at the end of every year we get a call from somebody and they're in a bit of a panic and they say, we've got to talk to you. We've really got a problem. We, we made a profit this year. We didn't go in the hole. What are we going to do? And you're like, well, we don't call that profit in our business. We call that revenue in excessive expenses. And they don't understand that nonprofit is not a business goal. <laughs> it just describes what your business purpose is. Okay, you're not, your goal is not to lose money every year. Your goal is to fulfill your nonprofit purpose. So we could talk to both of you for a long time. I'm going to wind up by uh, inviting each of you to make kind of a closing statement if there's something you've been reflecting on or, or thinking. I just want to say because we've had touched so many topics, both organizations have written materials on them, churchlawgroup.com has just a great series of uh, resources, leadnet.org. You go to leadnet dot org slash salary lead that dot org slash mega church lead that dot org uh, uh, main page and do a search and you can find lots of good materials on both of our websites dave travis final word then dave david middlebrook yeah i, I will say uh, the only cases where i've seen the church's a pastor's name on a property title or a family's name on a property title 
is when I used to work with, with small country churches, when a church was really attached to a cemetery where the family owned the land and said, we're going to give you the land where, you, where we can build a church. And so the property was owned by a family uh, kind of thing. And also on the cemetery. And, but this was, you know, 100 years ago <laughs> when those deeds were set up. And I have seen conflict come from that when, you know, a church decides to do something or the church burns down and, and the church says, we're not going to rebuild. And the family says, well, you have to. I mean, but that's the only case I've seen that. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, we talked about external boards and kind of uh, touched on that. Um, and, you know, the reporters I've talked to about this issue um, seem to think that's a problem. But in most of the cases where we've seen external boards lately have been able to move very quickly when it comes to moral failure or malfeasance to uh, fire the pastor or to remove the pastor. Whereas I've seen other cases where there were internal boards that would avoid the issue and um, not address real issues uh, immediately. Um, so this is a case where an external board can make a big difference very quickly. Uh, when a crisis occurs. So that was one thing I did want to touch on. But thank you, Warren. Uh, LeadNet.org for everything Leadership Network, uh, working to foster innovation movements and activate the church to greater impact. Thank you, Warren. Well, I, I thank you as well, Warren. I think this is an important topic. It's, a, it's an area that people have a lot of confusion. Understandably, they don't, they don't live in this world, but there is a lot of materials you can find on our website and other places, uh, churchlawgroup.com, that will begin to explain really what the relative duties are, uh, you know, what are bylaws, what's the difference between bylaws and articles, what are the duties of a director, what's the difference between a director and officer, all of these things are so fundamental. And again, I go back to the First Amendment, which we're so blessed to live in a country that our religious freedoms and our exercises are protected. But, but if we don't deal with them, we have to understand that we will be held account accountable for the bylaws that we have, for example. Those are the laws by which you'll be judged by a court. The rules are out there. You can understand them. And if you'll take the time, then you get to exercise that religious freedom with confidence and peace of mind. And in terms of the structural issues, I always tell folks, you know, what's right for you, what's right for your organization. Um, there's just so many ways to do this and do it correctly, but it just takes time and some thought and, and being conscious about um, what, what you want to achieve ultimately as an organization and making sure that the people in leadership understand what their rules are, the rules are so that they can fulfill their duties. And uh, so um, the media doesn't necessarily understand it either. And uh, so we just try to encourage people that, that if they'll take the time and they'll think about it thoughtfully and prayerfully, uh, that, that it can be structured in such a way that they can fulfill their calling and at the same time fulfill their legal duties and obligations. Well, thank you, Dave Travis, CEO of Leadership Network, David Middlebrook, founder of churchlawgroup.com. Uh, the good news is uh, through both your organizations, a lot of resources are available. So no church, no leader needs to feel alone. Thank you.